Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today with all of you, uh, starting together our third web seminar in this cycle of activities called Living in Between Spaces, organized by the World Social Initiative Forum, a project of the section of social sciences at the Getiano. My name is Juan Botero. I am in Buenos Aires, Argentina, the place where I was born. I work as coordinator for the World Social Initiative Forum, and I also work here in Latin America for the development of ethical banking. In these cycles of web seminars, we aim to address the most urgent challenges and relevant themes we have as a global society. Today, we invite you all to enter into a dialogue with us with a special proposal and challenging question. What is my place? The challenges of inclusion. For this, we are not alone. We have two great guests to reflect on this theme. James Lee, CEO of Camp Hill Village in South Africa, and Bart van Mechelen, member of the leadership team of the Anthroposophic Council for Inclusive Social Development. As always, Jones Lee, project leader of the World Social Initiative Forum, is here with us as well in order to welcome us all and stream us into the theme of today. Hello, Joan. Hello, Bart. Hello, James. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> How are you? Fine. Too. Okay. okay. As you might know already, the duration of this web seminar is one hour. And after John Lee's first words, James Lee will start with his contribution and then Bart's. In the meantime, we invite you all to be active in the chat with comments and questions. Our intention is to collect some of those questions from the Facebook chat and bring them, bring them here to the studio as a closure for this, this session. Uh, also, part of a World Social Initiative Forum team, Nicole and Mila, are also present there in the chat and they are ready to answer uh, and keep this dialogue alive. Thank you both for being there. So now, Joan, before we, uh, sorry, before we start with Joan, I'd like to give you a short this, uh, introduction of these two guests that they are, uh, this is not the first time that we work together. Uh, let me just tell you this, that James Lee took part in our um, event, our international forum last year in Egypt as one of the main speakers, the keynote speakers, and Bart did the same in our in our event with young volunteers in the Getianum last year, with I think more than 80 young volunteers coming from all around the world, uh, gathering there. And in, in Egypt, we had, I think, in total around four, 300 people gathering there. So it was two big events, very powerful. And both of these guests we have here with us once more. Uh, we already worked together. So it's a pleasure to see you again, Bart and James. Thank you for taking the time. So, James Lee is the CEO of Camp Hill Village West Coast, a social enterprise and organization in Cape Town, South Africa, that develops the potential of people with intellectual disabilities. The organization now supports 80, 95 residents who live on the premises and work in the enterprises that assist with the sustainability of the organization. Prior to working at Camp Hill Village, for 18 years, James Lee ran a successful marketing and advertising agency in Cape Town, working with clients ranging from United Nations to small entrepreneurs. He's an integral coach certified by the Graduate School of Businesses Center of, uh, sorry, for coaching. He has diverse coaching experience and has worked for many years as a coach, counselor, and trauma counselor. But Van Mechelen, born in Belgium, he studied sociology, sorry, psychology, anthroposophy, and social development. He works in the field of curative education as a director in a daycare center, a part-time staff member for quality development, and a training coach in residential care center. Since 2016, he has been appointed as a class holder for the curative education movement in the School of Spiritual Science. Having strong connections to the Gautianum Meditation Initiative worldwide, 
the group that organizes the Living Connection Conferences. He also represents the Curative Education and Social Therapy Council, Utianum in the ECCE and Alien Core Group. He is currently the General Secretary of the Anthroposophical Society in Belgium and a member of the leadership team of the Curative Education and Social Therapy Council at the Gutianum. I truly cannot think of better people to really address this topic today, so thank you for being here once more. Now, I think we are ready to start. Joan, all yours. And I have an opening question for you. Let me just look for this. So my opening question for you, Joan, is why this theme of place, sense of belonging and inclusion is so relevant for the World Social Initiative Forum today? Thank you, Juan. A very good question. And hello, everybody. I can't see you, but you can see me. And I hope that there are many of you out there who are going to go into an inner dialogue with us. The World Social Initiative Forum and why is this question of place and inclusivity important for the World Social Initiative Forum? I would say, Juan, that this is our key work. Our key intention is to create spaces, design and create and you know, in, in a way hold spaces of meeting, spaces of encounter, spaces of receiving something which is unknown to us as such, as such, which is new. And I would like to bring a little picture and that is this image of hospitality. I think when we create forums, we see ourselves as a host and if we create a place, a space which is prepared, which is hosted, which is open to inviting guests into that space. That's what hospitality is about, for me at least. And if I'm inviting guests into my space, I like to prepare that space. And I like to create a nice ambiance. And I like to put my energy into that space as far as I can. And this is what the World Social Initiative Forum does in the forums. We create a space. But we don't do that alone because we, unless we're in our own homes, but we usually in our forums are invited to go to different places in the world. And there we have to co-create these spaces with the local um, situation, the local question, the local needs. And this is a community, a communal creating of spaces. And so together we host a space where we invite guests in. And what is it when we invite a guest into our space? A guest comes with his own personality, his own being, his own experience, his own in, um, identity and interest. And he brings himself into a place, a place of hospitality, a place, the hosting space. And so the host, can prepare the space, but he needs to be open to something new, needs to be open to what he doesn't know about the other person. And for me, this is an important aspect of inclusion, because inclusion doesn't mean, for at least for me and for the World Social Initiative Forum, that we include everybody that we know or we understand or we're interested in. But the whole point of the World Social Initiative Forum is to create spaces of meeting diversity, of meeting people and ways of life and thoughts, ways of thinking, ways of being, which are not our own, which we don't understand perhaps. And to me, that is a sense of this inclusion. And if the guest that I invite into my space brings itself, brings himself, it nurtures and fills and shares my hosting space, as do I. So I create the space and share then and try to include what is other and unknown to me in that space. And I can only be, this is an important aspect for the World Social Initiative Forum, we can only exist if we receive guests. In other words, if anybody's interested in visiting our space. So if you weren't here today listening and joining in with this dialogue, in a dialogue, we can't be hosts. The host can only give its space and prepare that, that meeting space which enhances all people, that's the idea, through the encounter, both 
are enhanced, the guest and the host. But the host can only be a hostess or a host if there is a guest. So the guest entering into that space of hospitality allows it to be a space of hospitality. And the host welcoming the guest, the unknown, the mm, what might be new into that space, which is its own prepared space, allows it to enhance and to grow its own capacity. So the guest is relieved of its isolation outside of the hosting space and the host is given its task. And therefore, the place that we create is the place of belonging for both. It allows both the host and the guest to become what they truly intend through each other. I hope that makes sense. And so with this, I would like to open this theme and ask James first, my brother, to tell us about his experience of inclusion, inclusivity in the Camp Hill community that we both grew up in and which he now manages. James, over to you. Thank you. Am I unmuted? Good afternoon, everyone. Or Good morning or good evening, wherever you are. I'd like to take you on a journey down to the south southern tip of Africa and slightly up the west coast, where we have an organization called Campbell Village near Cape Town. It's an organization for people with intellectual disabilities, and our aim is to empower these people into living a normal life. We have 95 residents who live and work on a large farm setting and we have enterprises where each of them can work as meaningful a work as possible. We have an operational farm, a dairy where we produce milk and yogurt and cheese. And we have a bakery and we produce herbal cosmetics. Our products are delivered to Cape Town daily um, on a cool delivery truck and we supply shops and supermarkets in the greater Cape Town area. We've become known throughout Cape Town um, as producers of one of the best yogurts available. Juan, could you just put up a picture? Juan? Okay. I think There we go. That's our delivery truck on its way to Cape Town. I think one of the greatest challenges in the work that we do is to understand this word inclusivity. What does inclusivity mean and what are the challenges of inclusion? Many countries in Europe um, strive for an inclusive model for people with disabilities. And in South Africa, our governments also strives to create this inclusive model. We have quite a lot of pressure on us from the government to run what's called an inclusive model. What that really means is that people who are marginalized can be brought into our community. We can give them the adequate skills. They can go back out into society and live a life where they can contribute. And in theory, that's a good idea. But in a country like South Africa, it's often very difficult. We have a country with a very high um, unemployment rates, high crime. And in all the past experiences that we've had, the people who go back into the larger society, they end up in various levels of abuse and often very alienated. And so that does bring up the question, what's, what does a society need to look like to be able to be inclusive? And that's a question that we've spoken to the government about and our Department of Social Development. And what we've tried to do instead is to create an environment that is safe but inclusive. And this is... Um, this is a challenge in a way, um, 
and this is something that we're grappling with constantly in terms of what does this society really look like. But we had quite an incredible experience during lockdown, um, which I'd like to share. And I think this shone some light on what inclusivity actually means. Um, Juan, if you can just put up the next picture. This is one of our vegetable gardens. In during during COVID, now so from from March, um, South Africa went into one of the probably one of the strictest lockdown periods um, or one of the strictest lockdown conditions in the world. We we had a very intensive lockdown, um, very intensive lockdown um conditions and our residents at camp hill um were were locked in but the majority of the staff were not able to were not able to be there so we had the situation where we had 95 residents locked in locked at home um, or locked in at camp hill and most of the staff were not there there were enterprises to be run and there were there were levels of care that needed to be um sorry i'm struggling a little bit but i'll get my i'll get my mojo back so our our enterprises needed to continue and carers were not there and we had a couple of days to prepare um to prepare what we were going to do and we spoke to we spoke to the residents and we said, what, what should we do in this situation? Should we try and get more staff? And almost every resident said, we would like, we will be fine. We will, we will rise to the occasion. And the most incredible thing happened in, in that period. And that was that people, people with disabilities really rose to the occasion. And we had, we had situations where people couldn't walk and they sat on stools and they cooked they cooked um, meals. We had people in wheelchairs who were taken to the garden and they harvested potatoes. They climbed out of their wheelchairs and they harvested potatoes. And it was absolutely incredible to see that this community pulled together and it really it really functioned as a as an organism. And I think what was even more incredible was that each of the people really bloomed and i mean we were amazed at why at, at these people who really bloomed and it really prompted me and the staff to say what is it what what actually is the reason for these people what is the reason that people bloomed they were pushed out of their comfort zone yes um, they were an integral part of the group, yes. But I think it was because they felt they were needed and they were dependent upon, as opposed to being dependent on others. And this really made me question this relationship between being needed and being supported. And I started to wonder, is this, what forms that fabric of inclusion? What is that relationship between being needed by our community and being supported by it? And for, for many of us, finding that right balance is probably a struggle. Um, but if we get that balance right, I think we create a space within ourselves that we can actually bloom. And this was something that, that we really were able to witness. I almost feel like being supported and being being supported and being needed is almost like the warp and the weft of the fabric of inclusion. And the closer we move to an inclusive society, the more these boundaries between the two start to disappear. Um, in, in corporate language, many people talk about this moment of swing where a group or a team becomes one organism. And this is really an exciting experience to be part of. And I would 
say that that's that's the space when people are really operating at their peak it's almost a true experience of inclusion and this this relationship between being needed and being supported it also occurs between a smallish community and or a community and a larger community and if this relationship is healthy it's it can mean that the community the community that is in relation with its larger community can stay relevant and can develop a healthy and sustainable um or can become healthy and sustainable i think that relationship between small community and larger community is 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 really important and if we stay if we take an even larger um or if we take an even greater step out we can realize that our community is part of an ecosystem and if we strive to get that balance right that we work inclusively with the soil the weather the seasons we can find far greater harmony our village is on the west coast of south africa and in we farm in very sandy soil and we have these really harsh dry summers and one of the plants that really survives well in these conditions are cactuses they they're incredibly resilient their thorns protect them from predators and they can survive for months without without water they can find moisture in the dew they can find moisture in the air um and and i often say that if we left our community and we came back 5 years later probably the only things that would have survived would have been the cactuses but if you create the right conditions for them the right soil that sandy and not too rich the right amount of water they can bloom with the most beautiful incredible flowers and in fact it's really hard to believe that these flowers come out of these dry spiky plants our occupational therapist at Campbell she she wrote a story at the end of um at the end of this lockdown period where she compared some of our residents to cactuses and really try to say what what are these conditions that you can create to to make somebody to make somebody bloom and in using that analogy we we had we had we we looked at what 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 is this environment that we can try and create and for a cactus to bloom it needs to be an environment that's close to its natural environment but it needs to be given slightly more attention than would occur in the wild it's very unpredictable when they when they're going to flower and they often these flowers only last for one day through curiosity we can start to observe when they start budding and in that time one can give extra water or nutrition and similarly i think if we have a constant attitude of curiosity and interest in the other that's when we can that's when we can give the other the space to step into growing and blooming the minute we step into the role of thinking we know what the other wants or being an expert this curiosity disappears and the person we're working with Will retract into their personality or their disability. In in my talk in Cairo um, at the Social Initiative Forum, I spoke about the space between the carer and the person that's being cared for, and that relationship, and what happens in that space. And it can either be an incredibly potentially powerful space. what can be a very dis um disabling space um there can be a creation of codependence and and disabling and when the roles between the carer and the cared for diminish or even disappear and the potential of each person is what is in focus 
that is when this magic starts to happen. In the care industry, we, we are constantly under pressure from authorities for us to be experts in the field. And we are given many guidelines in terms of how to care for others, in terms of how to analyze others, um, better and more effective ways. People are grouped into categories and the uniqueness and the individuality can often be overlooked. And this is, this is a danger. And I think us in the care industry have a huge responsibility to stay curious so that we can acknowledge and draw up the uniqueness and the individuality. We can create a rich and inclusive, beautiful tapestry within each other and within our communities. And hopefully these can extend into the broader communities and have tendrils that reach out into the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Let me just show a picture that you actually sent to me of the flower Thank cactus. You. So, so wow, I'm very touched by your words, James. Thank, Thank you. you again. And, but we like to carry us farther out of this very, very deep and and contribution from James. Oh, you are mute, wait. Yes, thank you, James. Wonderful picture of this cactus with a beautiful flower, which all, almost has this feel of a fruit already in it. So I'll continue actually with what you bring, uh, James. But in a way, I would I would like to talk about what makes us prepare for this challenge that you speak about. How do I inwardly create in myself the conditions that I can work, that I can create this inner space for the others? So this is what, um, from my point of view, I would like to contribute today. What as an inner work I can do towards inclusion, towards how do I prepare this inner space where I can meet and the other one can come into being in myself so that I can connect and um, we can start working together. So this is finding the way that I engage in social life. And it actually starts with a very deep longing that we all have to be part of a community. This is so inherent in our human nature that we actually long to be in a community. We are actually a social being ourselves. So we can hear that in an expression, like it takes a village to raise a child or that we know the importance of bonding, of being in the presence of, an, of the attention and the awareness of another human being uh, to be able to grow and to learn human skills of listening and speaking and communicating. How do we see this val these values and these inner conditions um, developing now in our time, where we see also our development into stronger and stronger individualism. All over the world, we see that our development as human beings is in going into this direction of individualism. Actually, when we look back in history, we saw that to create a community, there was also a need for preparation. Uh, for instance, in the strong communities of religious um, cloisters or um, religious um, orders, people prepared for a long time and had three values, three vows to prepare for the obedience, the chastity and the poverty as three capaci inner capacities to be able to create community life. Obedience, to be able 
to serve a higher ideal and to put yourself into service of a higher ideal. Chastity is actually the virtue of purifying yourself or cure, being or trying to be as pure as possible to receive and to truly reflect in the encounter what you meet in the encounter with another one, with another human being. And the virtue of poverty, that actually you don't take the fruits of your work for yourself, but you make it available for the community and yourself try not to be too attached to them, but to give. These three virtues are actually still relevant in bringing ourselves into social life in a way that we can bring them in a true individual way in modern day society, in modern day encounters. And the first step that we take then is to, to go into the encounter with true interest. True interest to meet the needs of the other people. This is one first orientation that I can, as an individual, engage myself into the social life. How do I perceive the needs of the people around me and actually live with them or connect with them in such a way that I can perceive these as needs of myself, that I identify with these needs, creates a sphere of brotherhood in working together. On another level, I can open up myself to engage the other human being in his uniqueness, in his indiv individuality, as a true spiritual being. And with spiritual we mean that this human being is constantly in developing. He is actually in his development manifesting more and more how we as a human being can be the representative of humanity and be the representative of the whole creation. We have the, this capacity of connecting ourselves and then represent the wisdom, the spiritual connectedness of the whole cosmos in ourselves. And on this level, we feel that we are brothers and sisters, you could say, in a spiritual light. And there's a third realm, and that's the realm of our clear thinking that we have as a human, as humanity, been developing over the years. And to bring this clarity of thought in all the aspects of science, so that we can actually spiritualize science in all areas of life. So these qualities can be developed inwardly and can be strengthened inwardly, but can also be celebrated in our community. And that is, for instance, in curative education and social therapy, what we love to do. We love to celebrate, have festivals. And if, in having festivals, it's not just having fun. It is also making tangible the virtues, the qualities, the ideals, the inspiration that we live by and that um, strengthen our inner work and our, um, our daily work. For instance, now we are going towards Christmas and we celebrate with the children the festival of Michaelmas, then the festival of St. Martin, and then the festival of St. Nicholas here in Belgium and Holland is a very important festival. And for instance, the festival of St. Nicholas is not only about celebrating an old saint that has brought a certain quality into human culture, but we celebrate actually how we see these values be reflected in our own attitude as educators, as people who care for other, for children, for instance. The way that Saint Nicholas looks to the child, he brings a present which is actually, in a deeper sense, something that this child can use or can play with to prepare for the future. So Saint Nicholas looks at what is 
the future capacity of this child. And this attitude is actually something that we as um, educators meet and want to bring into our work very strongly. So we celebrate, you could say, a pedagogical gesture in the festival of St. Nicholas. And in this way, the celebration of festivals can always be um, this rich experience that as human beings, we have our inner work, our inner values and core qualities and ideals, and that we actually share them with others in making it tangible and making it um, appear as a revelation in a certain sense in the way that we celebrate. So this is also a very strong social activity that strengthens the community and that creates the conditions for people to have this safe space as James already brought, where they can truly be themselves and be seen as, um, as spiritual beings in development. So then in the close encounter, for instance, what can we uh, bring um, as an attitude and this attitude of I can connect with someone else can also go in three steps. The first step is that I bring an active will in my perception, the way that I look at you, the way that I want to perceive you, not only the outer sur uh, surface appearance, so to say, but that I can with my, in the encounter, connect on a deeper level. And I can bring inner light, my understanding of being human, I can bring in the encounter. Rudolf Steiner calls this in the curative education course, loving devotion. I open up for the other with my will, enter into the way that I can perceive the other further than the outer appearance, further than the symptoms, he says, in the curative education course. And then to connect on a feeling level, in a deeper sense, is actually that I bring someone, that I bring in the encounter an image, that I go and look for, where do I see in the other one, the possibilities for development so that I can meet him as a de developing human being and bring wholeness, where I can see that someone struggles, where do I see also opportunities? And can I engage them on a third level to go this path with him or with her and bring in my actions, in my deeds, in my working together, this clarity of consciousness and commit myself in a life-sharing sense. And actually, in these three levels, we can have this attitude of, I create the space where the other one can be. An open mind, but I'm very open and not judgmental. An open heart that creates the conditions for bonding, you could say, for also connecting myself with the other. And then an open will to engage myself for the future, for the development of the other. And this is actually to create this space for inclusion. Two more minutes. Another perspective is that I can deepen what I have experienced when in the evening I look back to the review of the day. And the more I work with true images of human development, the more I will recognize in my review of the day what is essential. What opportunities did I meet to realize my ideals? And looking back, backwards, as Rudolf Steiner describes, what has happened during the day? What are the main new experiences of this day? What new could I bring? What could I develop today? then I will see that in this realization of opportunities for others, I also see reflected my own ideals. And in the, uh, in the evening, in the review, I can, as a, in a certain sense, harvest 
these fruits of the day and bring them into the night. And then in, in the night, these become part of my true being and the essential values and qualities and ideals that I want to bring into the world will be with me in a transformed form in the morning when I live into the day with expectations and with openness. An openness to encounter during the day what for me is um, coming from the future as opportunities to realize our ideals. So this meditation that we learn in, um, in curative education from the curative education course from Rudolf Steiner actually bring in the evening the opportunity or the possibility to perceive the divine working in me. And the Rudolf Steiner gives this one sentence mantra, in me is God. And in the morning, we have this opposite gesture that I can bring myself into, in the encounter, into the society, into the community, with all the best that I have in me to support the development of the others and of the whole. And I can do this with this attitude, I am in God, God being the possibility to realize, the possibility to work towards the ideal of true brotherhood, equality and freedom. I see that my time is up, but I can find these two gestures in the beautiful verse that Rudolf Steiner has given as the motto of social ethic. And maybe you can help me, Juan, by showing this motto that I can conclude by reading it as a kind of a summary sure. of what I wanted to bring. Yes, definitely. One second. So a healthy social life is found only when, in the mirror of each soul, the whole community finds its reflection. And when, in the whole community, the virtue of each one is living. Welcome. Thank you, Art. Okay, before uh, we jump into the next moment of our session, that is starting a dialogue uh, inspired by questions coming from the audience, uh, let me just say that I'm very touched by today's um, yeah encounter. Uh, even despite this is online or through a computer. Uh, I felt very touched and I, it was very nice to see the red thread developing from James to Bart with this curiosity uh, and perception of the other and Bart picked pick it up with this, this virtues and it really created a, a beautiful image for today's web seminar. So thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> before we jump into the questions, um, I was trying to, <clears throat> to bring uh, this into our current context. I think one and we, we mentioned this briefly at the beginning, but taking inclusion as we are putting it now um, in this sense of uh, attitude, as I as I understood it, uh, and also about the place because I this is the inner attitude of inclusive attitude of interest of the other attitude plus uh, situated lo location a uh, small community bigger community larger society global society plus community. And we are going uh, now in these very challenging times of um, quarantines that are, that are on since many, several months now. And, and how is this, maybe for you, just a few words, how is this challenge or this attitude? Also, I know that both of you are leaders of uh, big organizations. In your daily life, how is uh, this was an extra challenge? Or if you can share just a few, how is this moment for you in, in the place you are situated with all the responsibilities you are having uh, as leaders, how is this moment of uh, encounter with the other 
and 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 yeah the daily work as well if you just want to share also john please feel invited to to jump in Maybe briefly, I can start with this experience that I had when I first heard about this COVID pandemic, uh, how it developed in China back then, and how the first advices came, how we, by washing our hands, sanitizing, can actually prevent this pandemic from spreading and infecting in a very quick way a lot of people. And this gave me the image that this is now health in my own hands. I have the health of myself and take the health of myself, but also of other people in my own hands. And this was actually a very strong image for me that how we are responsible and given the opportunities to contribute to the health of humanity by taking care for each other. Of course, this has a big impact, and also this week we had a child infected, and you could see the consequences, but also the fear in co-workers and parents, what uh, go comes along. But it is a challenge to keep and to uphold, actually, the values that we have, and to go into the encounter and to in, the, um, in this supportive gesture towards the other is for me also, um, on the one hand, challenged by these measures, but on the other hand, um, as a way by contrast, puts it more to the foreground and makes it more uh, visible what is actually the core of our work. Also now we have to fight for it, uh, in spite of the masks and in spite of the distances, we really want to connect and encounter. And this is like um, in an image, uh, you could say that when the half of the face is covered, eye contact becomes more important. Jane? It's, it's been quite a beautiful experience to see this through the eyes of some of our residents. So it's quite difficult to describe these invisible germs that are floating around to people with various levels of intellectual disability. And we, we, our, our occupational therapist and our social worker have done lots of pictures and diagrams. And it's been quite interesting to think, okay, there are these invisible beings that are floating around that are contaminating people. And how do, we, how do we deal with this? And Bart, I really like your thing of saying this is in our hands. And what it's done is it's, it's really brought this whole awareness of germs into our organization in a very creative way. And in six months, which spanned the whole of winter, and we have some very old and frail people, not one person even had a snivelly nose. It was not one, not one infection, and we normally have flus and colds and all sorts of things. We not one, and it really was quite illuminating in a way. And then what I described in my talk was the other side of it, where where everybody felt we're we're in this together and it pulled people together. So, but at the same time, it alienated all their families, so they couldn't see their families. So there was this real combination of alienation and and community because it was quite it was it was quite incredible to see and and i just have to this one funny clip that somebody made um because i live in cape town and i drive in and she said do you also have COVID happening in cape town and i'm thinking it was only only in the in immediate environment where this where this COVID was happening so also very difficult to imagine it throughout the whole world Yes, I would like to just add one thing, picking up from what James also said now, that there's these two opposite sides, these opposite tendencies. And I think we are experiencing within ourselves this dichotomy as well. Um, how much is it my responsibility towards myself to take my own health and care in my hands, but also to stand for my rights, to decide when I want to 
self-isolate or wear a mask? Where do I take self-responsibility? And where do I carry societal responsibility? And suddenly we find ourselves in a much bigger dichotomy, in a much bigger awareness. And something which is very striking to me is that now I'm in Switzerland and Germany at the moment, and there the lockdown is not so intense anymore. It's kind of placed in the hands in the responsibility of the individuals. And there is now, since people can come together again, such a joy in human encounter. And it's almost like what used to, what we've been taking for granted, that I see people, that I talk to the ticket officer, that I talk to the neighbor, the person I pass or sit on the train with, suddenly it's become an event. It's almost become a gift to encounter another human being and there's a joy in that. There's such a joy in meeting people from all, all sorts of foreigners and different people. It's amazing. And that's something new that we can't take anything for granted anymore. I think. So I have uh, a few questions coming from the where I was I think now it's better. I have a few questions coming from the audience or the participants from the other side of the chat of Facebook. And let me show you one. Anna De Wild uh, asked us about the importance of trust. Let me read it. What do the two of you see the importance uh, of trust in your work? As Shane described, what he experienced during lockdown made me think of the follow. The challenges coming with the lockdown reveal the direct connection to self-trust and that intensely increased the, the trust in the other. This is one of the most pressing forces China demands for this time to strengthen the social realm. And then goes further with a really long uh, comment slash question, but I think the core concept of trust in terms of self-trust and trust in the other, especially in this context. Do you want me to answer? Do you want me to start? Mm. It's it's an interesting question. This this interest of trust because the, the maybe the opposite is that there's an enormous amount of fear. So so directors. Um, of organizations are very fearful that COVID will come in, that they will be liable. Um, it's almost that there's this, this, this concern that everybody's got to protect themselves, not only from COVID, but through regulations and laws. And, and, and somehow we've got to find that balance. Somehow we've got to carry on living. And, and I found as, as a leader, I, I really have to trust um, I, I really have to trust in, in what I feel and I have to make very bold decisions that could probably get me into trouble. But I have to make these, I have to trust because there's, it's, it's all changing so fast um, and, and we, can't, we can't wait, we can't sit and wonder, we can't wait for the laws to change. We've just got to act and it's, it's, we have to be bold. So I think that's something that I've had to learn to do and have had to do quickly. Yeah. Yes, I also want to take my image of, we have it in our hands a bit further that we cannot wait for the, or the, the, the measures that the government uh, takes are not enough, are not sufficient. We have to adapt to the real situation that we are in. So this also was a challenge for me in our little community in the daycare center, for instance, to implement what was um, uh, there as, a, as measures from the government, but at the same time, keep on thinking with clarity. What are we really uh, going into and what are the consequences of this and how does it support or hinder our work, hinders our work? So this trust that with engaging your clarity of thought, but also then, like James said, to act boldly and out of trust, this actually can bring down this fear and open the space for um, fruitful work. 
So the trust is a very essential uh, quality and essential feeling that we bring into society and that actually is brought about by this um, engagement and our capacities that we have to clarify what we experience through thinking and to bringing our will to engaging our will forces in uh, stepping courageously to the, towards the future. Thank you, Bart. Um, okay, so we are coming closer to the end. Uh, and I don't know if you want to stretch, we go with another question or otherwise we close it now. Let me, you tell me, how, how is the feeling? Do you want to go a bit further or otherwise we can close now on time? Is, if, you are, if it's okay for you, we can stretch five more minutes and then I bring another question. Yeah, I'm yeah. fine with it. Yeah, great. So um, let me see here. We have a late question just arriving. Wonder, David, wait, I will show it. David Fertro uh, says hello first. And then he wonders if you can say, some, say something about how the, how, sorry, if you can say more of how you see the School of Spiritual Science and its sections, and how can they support uh, it support this possibility in the current situation for finding community and finding community in shared vocational work, and through that the potential for mutual soul spiritual development. Maybe jo John, you want to pick this up. I Hello, invite David. You. Hello, David. That's a big question from you. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, to redefine our soul spiritual development, we need the other. As Bart said, the human being is integrally a community, a being up for community, a being that needs community. And I can find my soul spiritual development through you awakening it in me through an encounter. Again, this guest and host image. And an interesting thing, which you know very well, um, David, you've experienced that, and that is that we now across the world are looking for the network. We are looking for our companions. We're looking for our coworkers and our colleagues across the world. And the more we are, in, we are um, have to be having these restrictions imposed upon ourselves that we can't move and travel and fly without going into quarantine. The more important it seems to be to have these kind of encounters via Zoom, via um, on, online conversations, and where we can actually meet and engage in collaboration with each other worldwide. And it was interesting what what Juan said after listening to James and Bart's short talks. He said, "I'm touched, even though." We're on an online platform, I feel touched. And I want to really, um, in a way, put this out as a call. Let's take the challenge and learn or try or practice to be so present in these conversations, in these webinars or workshops online, that we actually manage to penetrate through this um, technique technical, technological boundary or barrier and actually see through to that striving being in the other. And I think through that we can really help to not only support each other, but to actually grow the spiritual fabric of society. Whether that is the sections, that means those people in the vocational fields, like all the doctors meeting and collaborating, all the farmers or all the teachers, or us who are holding this question of social awareness, social justice, it doesn't matter where. I think if we see each other and every human being as a spiritual being in becoming, in transformation, and we take this platform because we can't meet in person as easily as we used to, that we take this platform and really stretch our capacities, then I believe that we can find a new way of meeting human being to human being in our true humanity. And that for me is this area of inclusion where we truly meet and where there's 
a level of yeah, equality is maybe is, is even an earthly word where equality doesn't matter anymore, diversity doesn't count anymore, because the soul spiritual on the soul spiritual level, there are no differences. We are all at home. That's inclusivity, I think. Thank you, Joan. And uh, let me, before we come to the end, uh, share a comment. This is not a question, but rather a comment. And I, I think it's nice for you as guests and also contributors to get a bit of feedback. So, <clears throat> Agatha Kasi says, inclusion in the sense of attitude. This is a big challenge for those not living in an anthroposophical community, especially at the moment. I will have to think about the many important things all of you told us. Right now, <clears throat> I do not have the question. Too many things, masks, distancing, etc. And we all live the situation with different feelings. Very grateful. Thank you for offering this forum. And as a closure, I like to invite invite us all uh, to give maybe a last reflection. It could be in the form of a question, it could be a statement, it could be uh, whatever you feel. Uh, something short, but a message, thinking on all, all of those people that are there on the other side, all around the world, uh, watching this. And also, in the coming days, this video will be also watched. So, a message, thinking on, in all those people on the other side. And if you want, I can start. And for me, I, I, what, I, what I take in a very deep manner out of this uh, well seminar today is this conviction about the, the presencing that I must have in the moment and, and, and this trust in order to be attentive of my senses in order to perceive really the other and not put immediately a, a conceptions that I already had from the past, but really be attentive. And I, this is something I knew from the past, but I take like a deeper commitment now and or like a remembering stronger how important this is in any, in any interaction I have during the day. In, so inclusion is not about um, uh, social institutions one to the other, but also in this uh, moment by moment that I uh, carry through the day. So it's, thank you for that. And then as a, as, a, as a question, I will take from this web seminar, um, I think especially what Bart was bringing at the end about the clarity of thought and, and how is this in this moment where we, this, this, this trust in oneself and in the moment and in the context that we need to take all decisions also as James said, and whereas you turn on the TV or the social media and so there are so many ringing bells and it's so confusing it's so easy to get lost if you look this information in the outside so it's like an invitation to really work within again i find and uh, so this is not so much a message for the others but uh, sharing how what are the two core things that I, i'm taking with after this session and now if you would like to share either a message or something please feel free Well, maybe I can just add to that, that, that what's, what's sort of come out is, is to stay curious, to stay curious of the other so that we're constantly learning. And I have this image, you know, of, of if, you, if every time you encounter someone, particularly if you work in care, but also in relation with other people, that it's almost as though you meet them for the first time again, every time. And, and that, the image that I was going to say is, is of a river. You know, if you look at a river and you look at it 10 minutes later, the water is completely different. It's not the same river. That water is already, that water has gone down and this is new water. And if that's the, if, if that's the inquisitivity that you can apply to people, I think, I think we're on the right track. I feel very grateful for you organizers to create this space online. And I feel like Joan said, the reality is um, is touching that I feel invited to really be here 
to fully commit myself to fully fully engage in this encounter and at the same time create a space listening space for the other and i hear also and i read also in the chats in the comments and uh, questions that people really could connect with us and uh, it fills me with gratitude so thank you all very much and i will have the final word and these are my two brothers james is my um, biological brother and Bart is my soul brother and he's just said what I actually wanted to say um, <laughs> but from his but from his perspective and I want to call I want to put out a call to all of you friends those who we know who the, those who don't know to everybody not only those who listen but to everybody a call to be bold to step up and to come and help creating spaces within yourself but also with us, with everybody you meet, spaces of inclusion, spaces where true humanity or the human being as a spiritual being in becoming can actually be present, can manifest, can meet each other. We need to do it now. We must be bold. So an uh, open invitation, a call for action. Come and join us or whoever your people are or yourself and yourself. Thank you. I have a proposal as closure uh, to put again the quote from Stena. Bart, would you mind to read it again as a closure? Okay. Yes. And then please, Bart, James and John, do not uh, leave the studio. So we, uh, after we, we, we close, just please don't leave. A healthy social life is found only when in the mirror of each soul, the whole community finds its reflection. And when, in the whole community, the virtue of each one is living. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Till Bye -bye. next time.